So the title of the book, the website, the whole project will be Teaching Classics Worldwide, subtitled Successes, Challenges and Developments. And it will be out early next year, so 2025, with a well-reputed editor, uh, publishing house, uh, Bloomsbury. So unfortunately, we do not yet have a copy of the book, but of course, we want to see, Stephen and John, how it looks like. So perhaps you can show us the cover already on a slide. So here we go. This will be the book. And if you are in a bookshop, you sort of see this cover, of course, and this is well, rather special. It's rather peculiar. So here comes my first question for you, John or Stephen. Just explain the cover. What is this? Why did you choose this one? Well, there is the cover, <clears throat> and it recalls a vase of uh, Exekias, the two warriors playing uh, a game. This all began when Steve got in touch with me and said that he had an idea to update the volume that uh, I produced in 2006, which was about uh, Europe. And this was 2006, a long time ago, and was getting out of date. And I thought, yes, this is a good idea to update the book that had come out then. And then he said, oh, I think we should extend it a little beyond Europe. And I said, oh, OK. Um, yes, we'll try to cover the whole world. So this was the ambitious project that uh, began uh, some time ago. So covering the world rather than uh, just Europe uh, led us to this cover picture. There is the uh, original 6th century amphora by Exequias. There is another version as well that's in the Louvre. Uh, and it recalls uh, these images. And they are by the New Zealand artist Marion Maguire. Uh, so classics in New Zealand really the other side of the world. You can't get much further away. And yet her images put Greek images, Greek vase pictures into an uh, Antipodean landscape, a New Zealand landscape from the other side of the world. So we thought about asking Marianne if we could uh, use one of her pictures. We thought, first of all, about the one in the center. Uh, there's the, the mountains, the vegetation of New Zealand. Uh, and if you look very closely in the tree on the left-hand side, your, your left, there is a figure of Captain Cook, the British uh, explorer who came to the islands in the 18th century, and he's tied up in that tree on the left, while the two Greek uh, soldiers uh, completely ignore him. Um, in the end, we, do, we went for the, uh, the one that is on the far left, that is on the, uh, the cover of the book, and this is uh, another complication. The Greek soldiers are replaced by Socrates on the, on the right, and Tito Kowaru uh, on the left. And this is from a series called Tito Kowaru's Dilemma. Now, he is a figure 
from New Zealand native uh, history and uh, there's a bit of legend attached to him as well, but he was a, a native Maori um, inhabitant of New Zealand before the European arrival. And uh, she shows him in discussion with Socrates. Uh, perhaps they're talking about civilization, about peace, about colonialism, about all kinds of, of things. So we thought this image reflected the spreading out of the classical world uh, all over, uh, reaching just about as far away um, as we could possibly get. This is a map covering the uh, places that are um, included in the book. Perhaps I'll hand over to Steve to... Yes, so um, one of the things that we found in terms of uh, accessing information from people was that some people were very easy to find. Um, Euro Classica was, of course, uh, an excellent place to start um, with people who'd already written for John in his previous book and who were easy to track down through um, Euro Classica's website and that. Others were slightly less easy and depended quite a lot on personal connections. So I have personal connections with a number of people in Australia and with America, um, and they were very willing to, to help out. And I thought, well, that's it. That's nice and straightforward, isn't it? And then I did something that perhaps I should have done right at the start and looked at a map of the world and tried to identify which countries there were, which I hadn't considered. And with that kind of dawning realization that there are I know this sounds stupid, but there are an awful lot of countries in the world which I had simply assumed didn't have any classics education at all. So I started looking carefully at organizations like FIAC, the Federation, and uh, other contacts. And it, it's what one describes as in research terms as a snowball effect. You ask and someone else refers you on to somebody else and refers you on to somebody else. And one of the reasons this book took quite a long time to put together was partly because COVID uh, intervened, but partly also because um, finding people who were willing and able to write um, was, was not perhaps quite as easy as we thought. Um, but that means to say that the people that we have got to contribute have been really committed to the project and we're really, really very, very grateful for all of them who did so. Um, some of the things about this map are quite interesting. I had not expected there to be quite so much in the right-hand end of the world. Um, I hadn't expected there very much to be so much in the south end part of the world. And call me naive, but that is what I found. And actually when compiling this and putting this map together, and of course editing the book itself, it was extremely gratifying to find out that in fact classics was not just confined to Europe and a few sporadic countries, but was actually living quite nicely and quite well all over the place. Um, it's different in different countries, of course. In South America, one of the main things seems to be that at the secondary school level, apart from one or two honorary exceptions, it's mostly at the university level. And I think we'll probably talk a little bit later about how that impacts on the uptake of classics um, in those countries. The other interesting places, of course, are China and Japan, where they have another very distinctive approach to what might be going on in the way of learning the ancient languages and about the ancient world in general. Um, South Africa and the southern part, well, the whole of Africa really, has some very interesting tales to tell, um, which we can, uh, we can read about in the book, obviously, but Christian might ask us some further questions about that. Um, there's one gap, which um, I apologize for, but it was about joining two pieces of map together, and that is Hawaii, which um, is the join in the map and does have classics. So there should be a spot in the middle of the Pacific Ocean for Hawaii. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Of course, we, we're very curious. You, you already sort of mentioned it, but but do you have some some nice anecdotes or some funny stories about you finding particular contributors? So you mentioned the networking already and the one referring to the other, but, but there must have been some surprises, perhaps, or unexpected contributors. Well, um, I was surprised, I think, by 
the South American, um, the extent of contributions that came in there and reading the, the, the chapters, the depth of uh, the, the history uh, of, of classical study uh, in, um, what have we got, Venezuela, um, Colombia, um, the, the, uh, we didn't manage to get contributions from, from everybody we asked, but uh, those ones that, that came in, Bolivia was, was one, wasn't it? Brazil, there's a lot of activity. So um, we don't have so much contact in Euroclassica from uh, that area, so perhaps that's, that was surprising to, to, to me. And um, the looking through the references for China, the, um, the, the, the depth of scholarship, the, 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 the dictionaries, the, the complications of, of actually uh, establishing the study of Greek and Latin uh, in, in, in Chinese. What do you actually use to um, deliver your teaching? That, um, that, that, that kind of thing. Um, any other? So, yeah. <clears throat> Um, in, terms, in terms of stories about uh, sourcing information, um, it was very interesting. Some, one of the things I found with the book, we asked everybody to, to write almost to a format. Um, we asked them to write about the numbers, if they had it, the relative status of the subject, whether there was more language work or non, more literature work or whatever it might be. So we tried to ask to a format. And some people stuck to that. Um, other people found the format didn't quite match. Um, but even within that format, there's quite a distinctive voice from each of the people who represent their countries. Um, it's always, as an, editor, you, as an editor, you kind of make a choice. Do you want to smooth everything down so it all sounds and looks the same? Or do you want to let those individual voices shine? And we decided that actually we wanted to let the voices come out because that was part of the cultural dimension of which the subject is taught. That you, you, can't, you can't turn Latin and Greek into this international language, these international languages, which is what they are, um, without hearing the individual voices about how people choose to do them. And so although there was a format, we let people have their head, as it were, and, and uh, represent their, their, their work in ways which are different from each other. And I think that comes across rather nicely. Um, some of the papers, some of the articles are, oops, that's a nice, it's a butterfly, it must be a good sign. Um, some of the articles are quite uh, strident, others, some of them are quite uh, gentle. Um, they are all, most of them, pretty darn positive um, about the status of their subject, but also inquisitive and inquiring about what their futures are. But looking at a couple of interesting stories, um, one of the things about, um, John's already mentioned the Chinese um, one, and that was a really interesting one because the author um, decided to involve a number of other people in compiling the chapter. Um, so Kiang Li basically got a student of his and a teacher to write sections. And that, again, different voices within the same chapter is interesting, and it gave people other sorts of ways of thinking about the subject within their countries. And I think that's really good. Um, other places where there aren't any languages anymore, for example, New Zealand has lost teaching Latin and Greek, Denmark doesn't have Latin and Greek, um, were more circumspect and more positive, obviously, about how they use uh, non-linguistic or translation literature uh, in their schools. And I think there are lessons to be learned there um, across the world for those countries where the languages are uh, perhaps not as, uh, I'd going to say viable um, in terms of the desperate financial problems that lots of places are in, um, you know, other ways of teaching or getting access to the classical world. There are two silly points, and I have to say I put them both in. Perhaps I should have left them out. But I discovered that there was Latin taught for a moment in Antarctica. Um, and also that there is Latin on the moon, um, which is a kind of silly thing, but it had to be mentioned. Um, a lot of the countries which are mentioned on that map just there 
um, didn't have a huge amount to say. Um, and therefore, at the end of each of our sections, the, each of the sections is um, about uh, a, a, a continent, effectively. Each of those sections finishes with some further reading, with the kind of snippets of information that John and I were able to find, many of which are just personal communications, where people, as it were, rang in, phoned in, and said, there's not a great deal going on, but I do have this. And those personal connections, I think, are really important because although they don't have full chapters to themselves, they do indicate the, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? They indicate the absolute determination in some countries and in some individual schools in countries to actually keep classics alive. Um, and I think that's really worth hearing as well. So, though there may be some countries which have beautifully well-formed chapters saying everything is wonderful and everything is running fine, there are quite a few chapters where there's a little bit more personality and a little bit more care and a little bit more anxiety sometimes about classics in their countries. And what we hope this book will achieve is that people will look across and see what works well in one place might be transferable to another. Thank you so much for these insights. So I'm now going to act as, as, as uh, the journalist I mentioned in my talks. So they always want to know about specific points um, and they want to know, like, to have like the, the general picture. So if, I know this is a hugely diff difficult question, but if I were to ask you, what are the main themes, the main issues, the main points that arise for classics all over the world, worldwide, what would you mention as main points? Yes, uh, uh, perhaps if we just move to the next slide, have a look at the sure. contents as well. Yes, um, uh, we, we do have several contributing authors in the audience, um, uh, so they will be uh, in, in this list. Uh, and we would um, like to thank those contributors very much for their hard work and their patience and perseverance in sometimes in difficult circumstances uh, to get these, these things in and to put up with our uh, editing and sending them back and saying, can we have your corrections by tomorrow, that kind, kind of thing. Um, so this is uh, Europe A to G, um, and we, uh, Austria, uh, Bosnia, Herzegovina are here, aren't they? Bulgaria, Croatia, uh, Finland, France, Georgia, Germany, they're all, all, all here. So uh, perhaps the next one. Um, and that's G to R, so we were pleased to get uh, a contribution from uh, Hungary and Iceland, uh, and we've got our Euro Classica regulars here, and uh, including Poland as well. We, we had made good contacts with Poland, who are Members, well, they're related to Euroclassic, but we don't often see them. Yes, the only non member is, is uh, Iceland so far. Yes, well, it, very interesting chapter uh, from, from Iceland. And the uh, next one. We are sorry we can't actually show you a copy uh, of, of the book, uh, but. Oh, okay. Oh, that was that was all of Europe. Okay, so well, well, let, let, let's um, pause there for the moment. Um, we do have um, proof copies, uh, two copies here. So if you'd like to see um, your chapter, uh, what it what it looks like in in the proof stage, um, then that is available here. Uh, the date, we're in the hands of the publishers and the printers, uh, the date we've been given is February 2025, but it's, it's, everything is completed and, and with the um, publishing house. Uh, now, sorry, um, 
main themes that, that Christian asked about. One thing that arose in several chapters was the presence of STEM subjects and the emphasis put on those science, technology, engineering and mathematical subjects. Uh, many national governments, national education systems seem to be promoting this area of study and many authors mention that this is a difficulty for recruitment uh, in the humanities generally and in um, classical subjects uh, in particular. They also mention recruitment to subjects and retention, getting pupils to start choosing to, to, to study classical subjects and the languages and then keeping them in the option systems right up to the final examinations. And we are talking about beginning studying the languages or classical subjects wherever that takes place. So frequently that is particularly in Europe, that is in secondary school, but uh, it may be uh, earlier, it may, there may be some primary school input. Um, there's a very interesting chapter in, on, in, from Brazil about that. Uh, it may be a higher level at beginning university for the, for the languages. So that's, that's the focus of the, of the whole thing. Uh, many authors bring up the question of, of usefulness. Uh, that that seems to be the criterion of choice of, of why people choose to do a particular subject, what use will it be? And that recurs in many places. So it may be that we, uh, promoting classics, uh, need to focus on other aspects of a humanities education that are not simply directly useful for a job, that doing this is good for something else. Um, why not emphasize what is good in itself of studying a particular uh, subject? Um, active Latin, which we will be focusing on, came up in many uh, chapters. The most quoted um, source material, um, didactic material, uh, the book to learn from, was uh, Orberg's um, uh, Lingua Latina. That, that is clearly now wide, in widespread use over many different countries. Um, and it was quite interesting to see what course books each country uses, and it may be that it's uneconomic, um, hasn't been possible to produce, uh, say, a Latin, um, a, a, a beginner's Latin book in a particular language. So. Um, some of you may be well used to this. You use a, a, a book from somewhere else. Um, and we have, I think, managed to collect a, a, quite a, a, a good range of, of material and, and to see how those course books actually are, are used and, and which ones they are. Um, I thought Greek, learning of ancient Greek, uh, doesn't come out all that well, um, that, that actually doing Greek language classes is um, something that a lot of chapters report on finding difficulty in starting those up. Um, and I thought that 
we could detect a, a move to studying cultural aspects of the ancient world, uh, even in specifically language courses. That it may be Latin that you're teaching, but uh, what is proposed is not just the course of uh, Latin grammar and vocabulary, but a, an introduction to the ancient world through the learning of uh, the language and using the language as an insight into the study of the, uh, the history, the culture, uh, and so on. Uh, yes, if I may just pick that, that thread up a little bit. Um, I think one of the early interesting things is that um, when you say Latin to most people outside this room, say, or outside of our classrooms, most people don't know what it is, or they associate it with a pedagogical approach, or they might associate it with a language, but most of them don't really know what it is, what we actually do. Um, and I think one of the things that comes out of this book is there are some areas which have a very clear understanding of what I describe as the symbiotic relationship between learning language and culture at the same time. So you learn the language in order to be able to find out about Roman culture. You learn Latin to learn about Roman culture. And you learn about Roman culture to help you with your language. The two work together. And I think there's a, a growing realization that the literature and the culture, the material culture side of things, is, is not to be seen as an add-on a thing to do in your spare time, a bit of a thing to finish off the lesson with, or to do on Thursday afternoons, but is to be more integrated with uh, the language learning. Partly because that is, I have to say, probably the energizing thing for students in our classes. They want to find out about Romans and Greeks, uh, but partly also because in terms of learning languages, language is culture, and we need to know the culture as well to understand the language. I think that's one thing that's coming through. And, and some of that is evidenced by quite a lot of the organizations and the, speak, uh, the, the contributors in, these book, in the book to talk about how they engage students outside the classroom uh, with cultural visits to museums and sites. Um, that has increased in ground. Having read John's book in 2006, it was something that happened occasionally and seems now to be much more widespread about the value of visits to sites and museums. And every place in Europe, certainly, and quite a lot of places uh, elsewhere, have uh, some cultural remains, even if they're just in a museum, to go and visit. Um, the other thing that we, uh, John also talked, on, talked briefly about was um, active approaches. Um, very popular in America, although not widespread as perhaps you might think, not perhaps as widespread as you might think. But it is popular because in the States, the examination system doesn't require it. I mean, there is basically little of an examin a nationally agreed examination system in the States, which means to say that in schools, teachers can play to their and their students' strengths. And there is a real interest in using more active approaches there. And that has percolated through into the UK through being the same language, let's face it, English is a differently spoken, but pretty much the same between the States and the UK. And through social media, um, there's an experimentation with slightly more active approaches in the UK. But our examination system is what I might describe as rather oppressive and rather traditional and moves very slowly. Um, research, well, people suggest really that in you know, seven years' time, the examination system might catch up with what we are doing in the classroom. And that is a problem that we have to try to persuade examiners, not just that this is a flash in the pan, interesting experiment, but that actually active Latin is a considered and worthy uh, inclusion in our everyday curricular practices. Uh, and the final thing really that I wanted to draw attention to was those countries which had lost Latin and the languages. Um, and again, I point to Denmark and I point to New Zealand. Denmark has a very strong tradition um, of uh, getting students to uh, embed and learn about ancient philosophy through Aristotle um, in their curriculum. And as Edith Hall, 
um, in the UK would advocate. Um, it's something that every child could learn about and every teacher could teach because it requires no specific training to teach somebody how to teach something in translation. And that's the problem that we have in the UK, not in Edith Hall, but the problem in the UK is that if we wish our subject to expand, it's finding the teachers to teach it. And that's one of the aspects which I think comes through quite strongly across the whole book, is we are very happy to teach it, but there aren't enough of us. And finding more of us and training us up to be able to do it is a real problem. I'm lucky in the UK in that we have a pretty established teacher training program. So there are three, four, five places in the UK where you can train to be a specialist classics teacher, and I teach them in Cambridge. Um, and over the whole of the UK, we train up about 70 teachers every year. But that doesn't match the 250 jobs advertised every year, and the more, the more being the schools who might want it but simply cannot source a teacher. And that is a problem that exists throughout the world there are not enough teachers being trained, and those teachers who are being trained sometimes find it difficult perhaps to adapt to the classrooms that they're in because their students are not quite like they were. I know that when I was a, te when I was a teacher, I was, sh I was surprised that the students in my class didn't want to learn quite in the way that I did. And I was quite surprised that the way that I had learned didn't quite fit with the way that they were learning. Now, I'm nearly 60 now, and I've watched Latin teaching for professionally for a very long time, 30, 40 years, and it has changed dramatically. And the thing that has changed most of all has been the introduction of online resources, on digital media, and all of those things. And we haven't mentioned the elephant in the room, maybe Christian is going to mention it now, but the elephant in the room being AI. <laughs> um, I feel completely out of my depth on AI. Um, as much as any teacher might have felt 20 years ago when the internet came up. Um, and you have to adapt. So I think those two things are intertwined. On the one hand, we want more members of staff because we want our subject not just to survive, but thrive and maybe even expand. But a lot of our students know an awful lot more about the way that they learn than we do. And we need to take cognizance of that and not just keep up with them, but anticipate the demand that they will lead with. Well, thank you so much. Isn't this amazing? So, so for those of you who are taking notes, I just recognize things that you find, well, I'd say in all countries. So if I just summarize, so this was about what are the main issues? So STEM subjects, then recruitment, how to find teachers, uh, usefulness, is it really useful to, to learn Latin and Greek? Uh, what about active approaches? What about the decline of, of uh, ancient Greek? And then what about uh, culture in language courses, moving to more cultural courses, integrating culture into language, and so on and so on. I think with every single teacher you basically uh, um, speak about uh, teaching of, of Latin and Greek, th this comes up. And so wonderful to hear that this is, these are the main uh, tendencies you also found in, in your book. Okay, let's go to the anecdotal again. Uh, were there any, um, apart from Latin on the moon, were there any other real surprises? Just one or two, because, yeah, just one or two. Uh, oh yes, um, there, are some, there are some countries that still require Latin for medicine uh, and for law. Uh, that was a surprise that, um, that there was compulsory Latin courses uh, for entry to those faculties. Um, uh, we were very pleased with the, um, the spread of the European net that we managed to um, bring in countries that, uh, that, that were, were a bit new. Um, I was surprised uh, that, um, picking up on the, the point about AI, that uh, new technology didn't feature quite as much as I thought it might. 
uh, in the overall looking through the through the whole um, span of the chapters. But uh, I would recommend um, the last chapter there, Steve's um, chapter on informal and online learning. Um, it is the last one, um, and I think the tendency will be to pick out chapters here and there where oh, I'm quite interested in, in this place and, and that sounds good. But there are um, rewards in reading through the whole thing and particularly uh, getting to the last chapter, which I think does point the way ahead and raises um, those, those kinds of questions. So I would, um, uh, I would recommend <laughs> reading right to the end if you can. Um, can, I, can I just add something on the uh, informal learning? I guess all of you will recognize this. Like, let's say 20, 25 years ago, what would have been the only Latin a pupil heard? The Latin pronounced by the teacher. Not? That was it. Now you just open the internet, it's, it's, it's everywhere. And you can hear all these different ways also of pronouncing the language. You can basically hear every single language you want. You can hear it, you can read it, it's all there. And so this is, I think this is really a, a new world just for, not just for classics teaching, but just for language learning, also for minority languages and so on and so on. There's, there's so many opportunities there. So we're really looking forward, uh, Stephen, to read that, uh, that last chapter two. Um, the following question might have a very brief answer. Of course, we're looking forward to it. Already at breakfast, we mentioned books and the future of books in which, I guess we can say we strongly believe, but following on from the, following on from the publication, are there other plans? Well, there will be a, um, an attendant website, um, and what we hope is that there are a number of places which haven't been able to contribute, and we're hoping that people will read the book and say, my country is not represented here, I need to put something in. Rather than wait for the second edition, which will be probably in about 10 years' time, um, or longer, if ever, um, if anybody has or knows somebody who has a chapter to write, or even just a few thousand words, to um, either make additions or to update or to say, here's a country you haven't considered, then we hope to be able to put that on a website. And maybe Euroclassica can be the place yeah. for something like that. Um, the other thing is that um, we gathered together an enormous amount of information. Um, I started off with, as, as I said, I was, I was naive to start off with. In my view, I just wanted, you know, with John Bulber to kind of repeat the book and his book and enlarge it and update it. But it turned into something I think that was more valuable, I don't mean to dis dis disrespect John's first book, but more valuable in a way because it contains information about contacts, um, organizations, um, textbooks, models of learning, and the issues of pedagogy, which are partly communal and partly specific to different countries. But it's a wealth of information and so I think it will provide a really good resource for anybody who's interested in classics education. If they want to find out who is the person to contact in country X, they will be able to find that person's name or that organization and with politeness, no doubt, contact them and make some use of it. And I think that's it's a kind of almanac, really, of classics education. Um, the thing that also needs to be done in the future is um, well, we, the website itself we hope to contain uh, information that has been missed off, um, but also a, a list of um, uh, places to go to, so organizations for national organizations um, to, to, to find out um, about classics in different countries. But I see we don't, there's no point in trying to replicate what Euroclassica is doing, so we need to obviously think carefully about, uh, about that, duplicate. Um, I'm very interested in how digital media are affecting the teaching of classics. Um, we wrote this book, we started writing this book as AI became more widely used. Uh, I just came back from a conference in Australia about teaching using AI, 
and I know that it's something that is going to affect every single one of us today and in the future. It's not going to go away. It's not going to make our lives any easier in some ways. In fact, it's going to make them slightly more difficult. We're going to have to think really carefully about how we police it and how we get students to use it responsibly and even academics using it responsibly. We were, Christian and I were talking about this this morning over breakfast about how AI is going to already does influence the way that academics um, source material, read material. Um, for example, uh, CUCD, just a little plug for the Council of University Classics Departments in the UK, is just about to publish a small series of articles about the use of AI uh, in the university sector um, and with some contributions there, and I hope to be writing a little bit for that as well. But I think that's going to be a massive area of interest um, digital textbooks. Um, in the UK, we're blessed with a number of digital textbooks or digital versions of textbooks which are widely used and which have very, very much affected the pedagogical approaches which people use in their classrooms. So the display of text on the board, the use of digital parsing tools, the use of uh, moving images, um, the creation of different sorts of reading resource, are part and parcel of what we do in the classroom. Um, one of the things that I uh, was really interested in um, from the conference I just came back from was one member of staff was using self-created texts of a source that he, of a topic that he personally was interested in and having AI tier them, i.e. make them at different levels of complexity, different levels of syntactical complexity, because the original AI version was too hard for him. So he asked it to tone it down a bit until he found the level that he wanted to, to improve his reading of Turkish, some of the language he personally wanted to learn to read. And the conversation I had with him went along the lines of this. How would you feel as an academic or as a teacher if you knew that your students were taking texts and manipulating them in those ways at home to, and he said, get better. I said, yes, that's the point, isn't it? To get better. I see a lot of teachers using text to test students from. The text is a means of testing students' understanding of vocabulary, syntax, whatever. We should be using our text as something to learn from, and we should be letting go of our text so that students can manipulate them in ways that suit them for learning from until they arrive at the original text. How they get from that starting point to the original text where we want them to be is going to be the challenge for us as pedagogues. How do we provide the resources and let the students have the independence to actually think for themselves about how they learn but give them the challenge and the uh, end point where we know that they've got there. That's going to be hard. Letting go. As teachers, we don't like to do that. <laughs> I think that letting go would already be the, the topic of a whole conference on its own. So, so really, uh, that, that's a good point, an interesting point. Thank you very much. My, my other question for both of you would be about uh, integrating local archaeology in uh, language course books. If I think of the UK, there's many books who brilliantly manage to, which brilliantly manage to do this, because of course there is, there are these museums, there is this, this local archaeology. But when I think about the country where I uh, spent two years of my academic career, namely uh, Finland, there's much less Roma, Roman or Greek local archaeology. So from a worldwide perspective, how do um, writers of, of handbooks deal with this? So with local archaeology, and what if there is not so much or no local archaeology for classics? Yes, that was something I, I picked up on in, in um, a number of chapters. Um, I think the new course that uh, Frank Collot is uh, developing in, in Luxembourg was one, and Peter Glatz's um, Austrian course that we were presented with last year. Um, they were remarkable in the, in the use of um, the local presence of um, 
resources, museums, and um, uh, the history there. So um, yes, I, the, the, there are others in uh, throughout the, um, uh, the, the the chapters that uh, show a similar kind of uh, idea. Fred, I don't have any recommendations as to what you should do if you if you are a long way away, like um, like in New Zealand, um, and yet there is a um, a very fine collection of Greek vases in Christchurch Museum in New Zealand. So um, there, there, there's always something, I think. Um, how long have we got? We've just got... Um, um, I'd just like to mention some of the controversies that perhaps are, uh, are coming up and that um, different people are, are facing. So that, that would really be indeed our very last question, which is an important one too. A bit about which we should speak openly too, and, and I did so a few years also in the context of, of Euro Classica. So there's all sorts of, of um, controversies going on nowadays too about the teaching of classics and the value of classics. And I think we should just be very open about this and discuss this. So that would be really my very last question for both of you. Can you just uh, pinpoint some uh, current controversies and how they are dealt with um, in the contributions? Yes, one thing that does emerge, I think, is that a controversy, uh, counter-arguments, difficulties that one country faces uh, may not be at all replicated in another. So what may appear to be an all-consuming question, uh, like uh, decolonization, for example, in the United States, um, decolonizing the curriculum is, is a big thing uh, and that classics falls into a, a, an area that is uh, European, is white, uh, is elitist, is um, difficult and uh, dominates the, the curriculum and positions of power and how is that all to be changed, that is a, a, a very current uh, area of debate. Um, this may not be replicated somewhere else, um, but we do face that. And in fact, the chapter here on the, from Zimbabwe um, by Obert van der Lumbo um, is a very good example of facing up to that question, this is um, uh, Southern Africa, what part does uh, education in Latin and Greek uh, have to do with that part of, of, of Africa? Uh, and, and, and that chapter deals with the, with the question, uh, um, I think, in, in a very balanced and um, restrained way. Um, the question of elitism crops up quite a lot. That is um, mentioned in, in many chapters that uh, this is a subject for the better off, the um, all kinds of class questions, racial questions can come into this as well. Um, we haven't got long. So um, the, the difficulty of languages uh, of Latin and Greek, of learning, and these are seen as difficult subjects. It's more um, challenging to gain a good mark in an examination. This is a perception in, in some places. Uh, so you choose the easier question. The teachers recommend pupils to choose the easier option where they will get a better mark. Um, how do we face up to that? Um, should Courses in classics at university level have a requirement for language study. Can you really study classical subjects at a, a high level without knowing the languages? This is a um, quite a burning question as, as well, um, as is the importance of non-linguistic classical civilization courses as opposed to the ones with the languages. Is it, uh, is it um, a second-rate classics? 
to do it without the languages. Um, those are things that we should be thinking about, I think, um, and they are raised in many of the chapters. Yes, I mean, I think um, this probably doesn't apply in most of the countries, um, but the very word classics is, in some places, problematic. Uh, and I don't need to go into all the details of the ramifications of that particular word. Um, but in the UK, for example, we have a differentiation between, at university level, something called classics and something called classical studies or classical civilization or ancient world studies. Classics involves the languages, literature and civilization. Classical civilization doesn't. And that is something which is very pertinent in the UK and less prominent, I think, in other places in the world where, for example, um, study of the ancient world forms part of the history curriculum and study of Latin forms part of the languages curriculum. And therefore, that kind of, that, the way in which the subjects are studied as part of different curricular setups doesn't problematize what it's called when you get to university. Um, the other problem, of course, is how do you attract students? This is the big challenge and maybe a controversy, is how do you attract students into doing it in the first place? And there are many places where if you're in the right school or in the right district or you're wealthy enough, you will be doing classics. You'll be doing Latin as part of your standard school, uh, standard school curriculum. But for those who are left out, the ones who didn't go to the right school or who were not in the right district or who weren't wealthy enough to attend the school which offered it in their local area, should we be ignoring them? Or should we be finding ways in which we can invite them into it? If classics is so darn good, why are we not making it available to everybody? And we should therefore ask ourselves, and I think quite a lot of the chapters ask themselves, if the subject is so good, what is preventing us, apart from money and apart from teachers, what is, what are we doing that's not getting students through our doors? And what can we do about it? Now, we're all human beings, and there are only 24 hours in every day, and we're all very, very stretched. And I just want to point to one thing that we've tried to do um, in the UK. Obviously, I'm going to talk about that, aren't I? Um, but one of the things we've tried to do in the UK, and I see replicated in a number of other places, is how we can use teaching online to bring students together who would not otherwise be able to do it, um, and how we can use universities to provide experiences, not just to attract them in, but to teach them so that then they become aware of what class the classics might be. Um, I was, uh, I'm an avid collector of snippets and bits of information about classics in the world around us. And it may be the way that you know, the algorithms on social media work, they kind of send me things that I'm interested in. But if you think about it, you could just spend the next week in your own minds just picking up where there is something classical in the news, on the radio, if anyone ever listens to the radio anymore, on the computer, wherever it might be, which can be broadly described as classics, Latin-related, Greek-related, ancient history, ancient world-related. And I think you'd be really surprised about how many there are. Hundreds and hundreds, I've noticed. Did you know, I'm going to mention this, Taylor Swift sang a song about Aristotle this week. Did you know, for example, that a railway engine called Hercules was repainted this week? This is the sort of stuff that gets sent me. Did you know, for example, that um, the, there was a, a mythological re-representation re of the statue of Eros on Shaftesbury Avenue in the center of London? Now, I, as a classicist, my ears go, oh! My eyes go, and I see those things, and I think, classics. How many of our students and parents let those things pass them by because they're not attuned to them? But if they knew about them, they might derive some interest, and who knows, they might persuade their kids it might be worthwhile having a look at that. So I think there's an awful lot of classics in the world that a lot of people are simply not aware of. And maybe one of the things that our job is to do is to talk to those people and to make the case for classics all around us, not just in the classroom. Okay. Just about these snippets, 
I have to tell you this too, uh, Stephen. So, so just a few months ago in Flanders, a book appeared written in Dutch, and the title is Zeus in Jeans. You will all understand, I guess, the Dutch, so it's just Zeus in jeans, and it's basically about this. It's about these um, snippets of ancient culture being everywhere, from pop music to popular advertising, everywhere. Okay, John, Stephen, thank you so much for these illuminating thoughts, for presenting this book, to which we are greatly looking forward.